Okay, so what we have here now is I just have a beaker of regular old water that's got my pH probe in it and it's got a spinner in it. And if it's tap water, then my pH should be pretty darn close to a uh, seven here. Um, but keep in mind that when you start talking about pH differences, any slight little change is going to uh, result in a fairly significant change in the pH. So my pH reader, uh, uh, meter is reading about an 8.6 right now, but it is dropping. If I gave this enough time, I imagine it would uh, get to about a pH of 7. Uh, there is another way to go about doing this, and that's to use an indicator. Uh, we are going to use an indicator today. The indicator that we are going to use is Universal Indicator, which I have right here. And Universal Indicator is cool because it's the colors of the rainbow starting at about a pH of 4 and then going up to a pH of about 10. It's Roy G. Biv, with G being in the middle, and G being uh, what the uh, middle pH is, so that's a pH of 7. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in some universal indicator here, and uh, hopefully we should see that we have a green color when we put this in. So there is my universal indicator, and sure enough, I get a nice green color. So yeah, I think I'm fairly satisfied that I'm around a pH of 7 here for this guy maybe a smidge above it. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put some acid in. So I've got some sulfuric acid here. So when I put my sulfuric acid here, take a moment and think, what color should this guy turn when I put my sulfuric acid in? Because um, again, I'm gonna take this to an acidic environment here. Um, so my acid goes in, and sure enough, it turns into a red color here because of Roy G. Biv, red being the acidic color. Now, I have a um, burette here that is filled with sodium hydroxide, and the sodium hydroxide is a base. So what's gonna happen when I start adding a base into this red solution here? Well, obviously it's going to neutralize it, right? So <clears throat> knowing that universal indicator is Roy G. Biv, red at about a four, orange at about a five, uh, yellow at about a six, green at about a seven, blue at about an eight, indigo at about a nine, and purple at about a 10. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna open up this valve here. I'm gonna open up my stopcock and I'm gonna put this in at a constant rate. Drip, 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 drip. And I'm not gonna touch it. And then what we're gonna do is we are going to watch the pH here get graphed on our graph as a function of time. But again, please keep in mind that I am adding it at a constant rate. So what should this graph look like if I were to add in this at a constant rate, think back to basic graphing skills from basic algebra, what kind of lines should I get if I'm adding things in at a constant rate? And then, consequently, what should I see as far as my colors are concerned if I'm adding it in at a constant rate and I am starting here at a red color? I'll give you a minute to think about that. Okay, so what's going to happen now is I'm going to go over here and I am going to um, start my flow of base. So again, I'm going to be taking a strong base and I'm going to be putting in there and I'm going to be putting it in at a constant rate. While I do that, I'm going to go ahead and click the collect button here on my device here. And if we are talking about a constant rate of data collection here, normally things that are a constant rate are a straight line. So most of the time, students will predict when we go uh, to do this that if you are talking about pH versus time, you are probably going to see a straight line going up and then you should see it change from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to indigo to violet. We should see a nice rainbow of fruit flavors here as the reaction um, uh, goes. So again here, what we should see is we should see the pH versus time, a straight line going up, going from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to indigo to violet, if again we are talking about things at a constant rate that's there. So let's go ahead and do the experiment and see what happens. 
you kind of need to be a chameleon here. You kind of need to watch with two sets of eyes. You need to watch the color change and you need to watch the graph as it goes uh, because um, the uh, graph is telling you what the pH is, but also the color is telling you what the pH is. Please note that the computer is going to be a little behind the uh, uh, color because of the, the time it takes to collect the data and so forth. So the computer is going to be a smidge behind what we see there. But most people predict that we're going to get a nice even trend of a straight line and a nice progression from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to indigo to violet. So let's go ahead and see what we can see here. I'm going to go ahead and open this guy up and just make it so that he drips. There we go. Drip, drip, drip. There we go. That's pretty good. And then I'm going to hit collect here. There we go. And collect. So we are drip, drip, dripping. I think I need it to go a little faster than this. So forgive me, I'm going to change this. Need to make it go just a smidge faster. Got to get it just right. Yeah, come on now. Come on. Too fast, too fast, too fast. Too fast. There we go. That's what I want. Okay. So now I'm at a constant rate. I've left it alone. And it's drip, 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 dripping away. Now, please note my graph. My pH really hasn't changed very much. And I'm still red. So here we are. We are drip, drip, dripping away. And the pH really, really, really hasn't changed very much. And now I have added a significant amount. I have added in at this point uh, 12 milliliters of this. I have added in a significant amount of this. And again, barely a change. We've gone up a little. The pH started at about 0.96 and now it's at about a 1. But again, I've added in a ton of this stuff and it really hasn't changed very much. And I'm still red by the way. So now I've added in about 18 milliliters and there's barely a change. I mean it's going up like we expected it to but it's certainly not the straight line that we would have expected it to be from before. And it's still red. I haven't seen orange, yellow, green, blue, nothing. It's still red. Now I'm going up a smidge. And maybe you can start to see a little action occurring over there on the beaker. But we're still red. Oh, wait a minute. Check it out. Wait a minute. <laughs> That's gone from red straight to purple. Uh, what is going on? I didn't see orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo. This thing just went from red straight to purple. And now, check out my graph. My graph is shooting up and it's skyrocketing is it just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up and up like that forever keep in mind that the graph is a little behind what's happening for realsies over there but now you'll notice that it is starting to level off a little bit. And as it levels off, it's slowing down.
So we didn't end up with a straight line at all. We ended up with an S-shaped curve. And the S-shaped curve is called the titration curve. One other thing to note, however, is if you check out our curve, where is about the middle of the curve? So the curve starts here and it goes up to there. That's about the middle of the curve. And if we check out where the middle of the curve is, oh wait, what pH is that right there? That is a pH of seven, right at about the middle of the curve. So what is going on with this titration curve? <clears throat> Hi guys, all right, so now what we're gonna do is try to see if we can figure out why the uh, titration curve made the silly shape that it made. Here's what we expected to have happen. What we had expected to have happen was that there to be a nice linear relationship between these pH values, meaning that if we were to start at three and go to four, for example, the distance between these two guys would be about the same as the distance between four and five, five and six, six and seven. This is what a linear scale looks like. A linear scale is like graph paper in that all of the differences between each of the spots are worth the same. The problem is, is as we have learned already, that the pH scale is not a linear scale. The pH scale is a logarithmic scale. And so if you're talking about a logarithmic scale, you are talking about a major difference between uh, each of them. And by major, I mean every time you change by one, you're really changing by a factor of 10. So for example, let's call the difference between seven and eight about one centimeter's worth of difference, okay? Now, if this was, again, a linear scale, the difference between eight and nine would again be one centimeter's worth of a difference, but this is not a linear scale, it's a logarithmic scale. And so consequently, because it's a logarithmic scale, if this is one, then the next time we do it, we have to increase by a factor of 10. So that would be about four inches, about 10 centimeters or so. So there is a nine. So seven, eight, and nine is 10 times as much. Now we're going to go to a pH of 10, and if this is a difference of 1, and this is a difference of 10, then our next one would have to be a difference of about 100, which would be about a meter away. So here we are now from 7 over to 10 is about a meter away, and you can see that what we're doing here is we are gradually increasing the amount every one that we go because we're really going by a factor of 10 in the logarithmic scale. So now, if I want to go to an 11, that would be four differences between there. So this would be one, and then 10 is the second one, and then 100 is the third one. And so that means our next one, our fourth one, would be a thousand, a factor of a thousand. And so a factor of a thousand would be about 10 steps down the way. So if we start here, it'd be about one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10 or so. So now here we are at an 11, and you can see what a huge difference it is from an 11 down to a 10, and then from a 10, it's a little bit less to a 9, 8, 7, and so forth. And then remember that anything that you do on the basic side of things, you have to repeat on the acid side of things. So if you're talking about from a 7 to a 6, then you're talking about a difference of 1. And if you're talking then about six, seven to five, that would be a difference of about 10. So again, it's about four inches or so, <clears throat> right around there or so. And then you're talking about uh, a full meter or so for the next one down to a pH of four. Now, if you want to get to a pH of three, that would be another factor of 10, one, 10, 100. So again, there's your one, there's your 10 there's your hundred to there now we got to go a thousand which is like again ten steps down the way one two five six seven eight nine ten or so now we're here at a ph of three if i wanted to go to a ph of two i would have to go a hundred steps down to the hall turn around go all the way down i have to go a hundred steps to go to the next one um, because every time we change by one, it's really changing by a factor of 10. So now what we can do is we can understand a little bit easier why this is what it is, because <clears throat> if you are 
changing by a factor of 10 each time, each one of these differences is not the same. So what we were doing was this. We were adding in, for example, a drop, and we went this much, and then a drop, and we went this much, and then a drop, and then we went this much. Each individual drop, you'll notice, is not really changing the pH very much at all because we are talking about such huge differences between the pH levels because of the logarithmic factor that each drop that I do is really not changing the pH very much. And then all of a sudden we get to here, and now all of a sudden one drop is starting to make a much bigger difference. And now one drop takes us to here, and one drop takes us to here, and now we're all the way through in just a space of just a couple of drops. So from here, one drop, two drops, three drops, three drops worth of substance, and we've gone from a four all the way up to a 10. So that's where the spike is in the titration curve because each of these values is so small relative to what it is that we are adding. But now that we're on the basic side of things, each drop becomes less and less and less and less and less important as we get further and further and further and further out. And then by the time we get to a pH of 11 here, we have really leveled out because again, if we wanted to go to a pH of 12, we would have to go 100 steps down this way. Right? We'd have to go 100 steps down that way in order to get to a pH of 12. And each individual step is not gonna do much. So when you do a titration curve and you are at the very, very top or the very, very bottom of it, because you are on the logarithmic scale, each individual amount that you add is really not very much. But by the time you get to these middle pHs, the uh, differences are so small because you are talking about a logarithmic scale that you can make a big difference in there. And so you can see how tough it is to do it and end up right at a pH of seven because one little fraction of a drop one way or the other, now all of a sudden you're at nine or now all of a sudden you're at five, hitting a pH of seven is very, very difficult to do. Okay guys, so what do we do about these particular situations? Uh, what kind of problems are you gonna be asked about titration curves? And uh, what are we supposed to know about them? Uh, again, quick reminder, uh, if this was a normal, situation if this was a linear relationship then what you would see is you would start down here at an extremely acidic environment and you would see a nice even straight line going up where you would pass from the red zone to the orange zone wherever that is so you would go from red assuming you're using universal indicator orange and then you'd go from that to yellow and then at um, at a pH of seven you'd be green and then you'd be blue and you get the idea here again this is for universal indicator indigo and violet up here whatever the case may be you'd see a nice even progression of these colors uh, but that's not what we saw was it when we did the experiment what we saw was that early on uh, not a whole lot happened and then all of a sudden we saw a spike we saw a spike Sorry, my drawing skills are not very good here right now. We saw not a whole lot happen, and then we saw a big spike, and then it leveled off. And that uh, big spike here uh, tells us uh, that you've got something strange going on. And again, the reason that that big spike exists is because this is not a normal curve. This is a logarithmic uh, curve. And uh, what we see here is the really important point in the graph, the most important point at all. Uh, if you have taken a calculus class, then you would recognize that if this is a curve, this would be where the concavity of the curve goes from positive to negative or negative to positive. If you were to take a couple of derivatives of this or maybe a couple of integrals of this, I don't know, math is a four-letter word to me. But the point is, is that that is going to be called the point of inflection, except that in chemistry, we don't call it the point of inflection. We call it the equivalence point. This here is called the equivalence point. And the equivalence point right here is a very important point in this. Uh, you'll notice that it is at a pH of 7 here, right? So if I were to draw a straight line, my equivalence point is right here at a pH of 7, which makes sense because <coughs> you've got a strong acid strong base 
situation going on. And if you've got a strong acid H positive and a strong base OH negative, and they are present equivalently or equally, then they react with each other entirely in order to make H2O, and H2O has a pH of 7. That is there. So the equivalence point is where the moles of the acid and the moles of the base are the same. So if we got rid of all of this, all of this, the important bit to know is that at that point right there, the moles of the acid and the moles of the base are the same at that equivalence point right there. So again, if this is your equivalence point, you could tell that this was a strong acid, strong base situation because you are here at a pH of 7. And you could also tell that this was, assuming that this is milliliters, this occurred at approximately 50 milliliters uh, in time, or in volume, I should say, not in time, uh, 50 milliliters uh, volume. And so knowing that that there is the equivalence point, you get the pH and you get the volume out of it. And so because the moles of the acid and the moles of the base are the same at that point, because they equal each other, then we have a variety of different equations that we may employ to answer and solve a variety of different problems. First of all, Remember that molarity is equal to moles per liter, or molarity times liter is equal to the moles, right? Or, to put it another way, molarity times the volume is equal to the moles, right? Well, if the molarity times the volume is equal to the moles and the moles are the same, then the molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid is going to get you the molarity of the base times the volume of the base. The point is, is that you can use the equivalence point then to figure out the concentration of an unknown substance, um, uh, either acid or base, depending on what your situation is, is if you can then compare it to a known substance um, and know where the equivalence point is and know where their appropriate volumes are. So what we see here is MAVA equals MBVB. This is the acid side of things, and this is the base side of things over here. Um, because again, what this is basically saying here is that the moles of your acid and the moles of your base are the same. All right, so let's take a look at a sample, very easy problem here. It says, if 20 milliliters of an unknown solution of hydrochloric acid, please note that it is strong, is titrated to the equivalence point with 30 milliliters of 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide. Again, you notice that it is a strong situation. What is the concentration of the HCl solution? So this is an MAVA equals MBVB situation. It wants to know what is the concentration of the HCl solution. So it wants to know that. That means it must have given you all of the other uh, variables that are there. And they did. So this is the volume of your acid right here. That's 20 milliliters. So that's 20 milliliters times MA. And then it took to get to the equivalence point 30 milliliters here. 30 milliliters of... 0.5 molarity of the base. Well, the 0.5 molarity is going to be the molarity of the base, so that's 0.5 molarity, and the volume of the base was here at 30 milliliters. That's this guy here, so that's this guy here, 30 milliliters. So, MA times 20 milliliters equals 0.5 times 30 milliliters, or if you go through and solve this, this would be that the molarity of the acid is 0.75 molarity, assuming I've got my math right. So basically what we're saying here, if we go back up to, for example, this guy here, what we are saying is that we had a... Uh, 0.5 molarity solution of the NaOH, and we know that we had a beaker, and that beaker contained 20 milliliters of unknown molarity HCl, and then into that we put in um, 30 milliliters 
of 0.5 molarity sodium hydroxide, and then we saw the titration curve run its way through, and it turns out that wherever we were at 7, that there is 30 milliliters. So my equivalence point was at 30 milliliters. So this is the real life situation here of what this problem is talking about. You've got a beaker with a known amount of an unknown solution of acid here, right? And then you've got a known amount of known concentration base here. And this is the curve that you got. So at 30 milliliters of the base, that's where the equivalence point was. So that's where you plug all of your numbers in. So that's example one. Example two, it says it required 40 milliliters of 0.2 molar HCl to reach the equivalence point with 28 milliliters of an unknown potassium hydroxide solution. What is the concentration of the KOH? So if we go back up here for a second, this is going to be the same thing, but it is going to technically be opposite here because what we're going to have is we are going to have a uh, burette and the burette is going to contain uh, 0.2 molar HCl. And I've got a beaker that contains 28 milliliters of unknown molarity sodium hydroxide. So if I put my probe into here and connect that with the computer, <clears throat> please note that the probe is currently in the basic side of things, and I'm going to be adding the acid to it. So it's the same thing, except it's going to be opposite, meaning we're going to start up here, and then we're going to go down and go over, because we're starting on the basic side and adding an acid to it. Regardless, it doesn't matter, because this is your equivalence point. And according to the problem, the equivalence point is reached... Um, at 40 milliliters. So that equivalence point here is reached when it was, again, this is not NaOH added, this is HCl that's added. The equivalence point was reached at 40 milliliters. So it took 40 milliliters of 0.2 molar hydrochloric acid to equal 28 milliliters of unknown molarity sodium hydroxide. And so... All we got to do is plug our stuff in. So 40 milliliters of 0.2 molar hydrochloric acid, that's VA and that's MA. And it was 28 milliliters, so that's VB. And an unknown KOH concentration, what is the concentration of the KOH? That's MB and that's our X. That's what we don't know. So this is going to be 0.2 molarity times 40 milliliters is going to be equal to um, x molarity times 28 milliliters and so do the math on that x molarity is going to be equal to about 0 0.286 molarity okay so at the equivalence point and this is really the key aspect of this at the equivalence point here is where we can do all of this chemistry uh, acid base gymnastics that we are doing right now. All right, let's check out example three. A beaker containing 10 milliliters of an unknown concentration of HNO3 was titrated with two molarity NaOH as seen below. What is the concentration of the HNO3 solution? So what we have to do is we have to find the equivalence point. Well, the equivalence point of a strong acid, strong base is going to be here at a pH of seven. So I'm going to go ahead and Put this over there like so and that's right there at your inflection point and then what we're going to do is we are going to drop down and when we drop down it appears that we've got about 16 milliliters so give or take i'm going to call it 16 milliliters so it took it was 10 milliliters of an unknown nitric acid so that's va Unknown concentration of nitric acid, so that's X, that's MA. And it was titrated with 2 molar sodium hydroxide, so that's MB. And according to our graph here, it took 16 milliliters, and so that's VB. So we take our numbers and we plug them in. I have uh, X molarity for my acid, 
times 10 milliliters for my acid, and that's going to be equal to 2 molarity for my base at 16 milliliters. And I go through and I solve for X molarity for my acid, and I end up with a value of about 3.2 molarity. So my acid was at about 3.2 molarity, where my base was at about 2 molarity. So these are all the same thing, just kind of variations on the theme. Example 4 says, 25 milliliters of an unknown concentration of lithium hydroxide was titrated with 0.15 molar hydrobromic acid. What is the concentration of the lithium hydroxide? So once again, this is a strong base, strong acid situation. So you find 7, which is your pH uh, there, your uh, um, equivalence point, I guess I should say. It looks to me, at any rate, like it is at about, right at about 6 milliliters. Keep it simple, we'll call it 6 milliliters. So this was 25 milliliters, so that's the volume of my base of an unknown concentration of that, so my molarity of my base is my X, and it's going to be titrated with 0.15 molarity of my acid, so that's MA, and it took 6 milliliters to get there, so that's VA. So if I go ahead and plug everything in, then I get 0.15 molarity times 6 milliliters is going to be equal to X molarity, times 25 milliliters and when I plug everything in I get that the molarity then is going to be equal to 0 0.036 molarity of my base it's there so those are your typical problems that you will see uh, for a strong acid strong base situation for your um, equivalence point